Good afternoon, Church. We continue our series on the Sermon on the Mount today. We are in the middle of a section where Jesus reveals the true meaning behind various parts of the Old Testament law. He speaks first about anger and murder, then adultery and divorce, then oaths, and then revenge. Jesus said in verse 20, to enter heaven, you must have a righteousness that surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. To enter heaven, you must have a righteousness that exceeds or surpasses the Pharisees and teachers of the law. Now, in each of these cases, he shows us what that surpassing righteousness looks like. Last week, we looked at the real meaning of murder. And today, we will look at the real meaning of adultery and divorce. Thank you for the music. Now, this is a difficult passage for some of us. But before we be and so before we begin this message, I want to remind you of God's grace and forgiveness in this area. Whether this is a painful part of your past or you are struggling with this right now in the present, I want you to know from the start that God's grace and forgiveness is there for you. God loves you. God is bigger than your sins. And He's able to redeem the hurt and the pain, even of adultery and divorce. So let's begin with our passage. In verse 27, Jesus said, you have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. Now Jesus is talking about the real meaning of adultery and divorce. And he begins by talking about first adultery. You have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. Now the command against adultery is the seventh of the 10 commandments. In Exodus 20, verse 14, and also Deuteronomy 5, 18. Jesus quoted here, word for word. And we are sure, apparently, the religious leaders, teachers, they were quoting it word for word as well. But the problem is, they were not teaching it correctly. For their long meet, Miss the point. And so Jesus brings back to the correct meaning of adultery. And not only so, he takes us deeper into the commandment. Verse 28. You have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery, but I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. This is the second time where Jesus said, you have heard that it was said, but I tell you. Remember, when Jesus said, but I tell you, he was claiming to be God. For only God can establish or alter the law of marriage. But I tell you, he was claiming to be God. My son recently came back from school, was telling me he, some classmate been asking him, where did Jesus claim that he is God? Where did Jesus claim that he is God in the Bible? I think these questions have been posed to many Christians nowadays. Here, Jesus said, 
But I tell you, he was claiming to be God. For not only God can establish, or can, for only God can establish or alter the laws of marriage. He is the son of God. He is God himself. I tell you that no anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Jesus looks at the attitude behind the act and says it is not just the physical act of sex that constitutes adultery, but also the lustful look. The lustful look. Once again, Jesus moved beyond the external actions to the attitudes and intents of the heart. Just as you can murder with your words, you can also commit adultery with your heart. Jesus said in Matthew 15, 19, For out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false testimony, and slander. The Pharisees, the religious leaders, they were so wrapped up in the technicalities that they forgot about the most important part of all when it comes to following God. And that is the attitude of your heart. The attitude of your heart. In this passage, Jesus affirmed God's law of purity and then explain the intent of this law was to reveal the sanctity of sex and the sinfulness of the human heart. God created sex. God protects sex. He has the authority to regulate it and to punish those who rebel against his law. Sexual impurity begins in the desires of the heart. Sexual impurities begins in the desires of the heart. Again, Jesus is not saying that lustful desires are identical to lustful deeds. And therefore, a person might just as well go ahead and commit adultery. After all, the physical act and the desire of the heart is identical. So I commit adultery. The desire and the deeds are not identical. But spiritually speaking, they are equivalent. The look that Jesus mentioned was not a, of course, not a casual glance, but a constant stare with the purpose of lasting. And so it is possible for a man to glance at a beautiful woman and know that she is beautiful, but not last after her. Last is wrong because you are no longer loving the other person, but you are using them. Last, seek to master and to conquer, but love, seek to serve. And so 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 14, it gives the following description of the wicked. With eyes full of adultery, they never stop sinning. <coughs> With eyes full of adultery, they never stop sinning. Now, brothers and sisters, in our society today, your handphone, I believe all have your handphone with you now, even for kids. What do you see on your handphone? Do you have to clear your throat? What do you see on your handphone? There are so many things there whether you like it or not, is there from you, isn't it? 
And I believe here, among us, brothers and sisters, yes, temptation. We are actually carrier temptations with us. Phone is indispensable, but we are carrying a temptations with us. You get the message? You understand what I mean? So church, our theme since last year, pursue holiness. So I'm here to remind each and every one of us here again. The intensity will increase for sure because everything is so convenient and it will just let our imagination run wild. But here, the Word of God says, remind us, it begins in the desire of our heart. It begins in the desire of our heart. And so, how do we get victory? What should your response be if you are struggling with lust? Jesus tells you to take extreme measures to get rid of anything that causes you to sin. Take a look at verse 29, 30. If your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. I look down from here. All have both arms. All have both eyes. <coughs> Jesus not, doesn't mean words here. His words were shocking to those who first heard them, even as they were shocking to some of us today. If your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it up. If your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. Why eye and hand? Because the eye and hands are usually the two culprits when it comes to sexual sins. And so they must be disciplined. Does Jesus really want you to cut off your body parts? Of course not. We must balance this teaching with other scriptures that tell us to take care of our bodies. Here, Jesus is using a dramatic word picture to make a point. And he is saying to you and I that we must deal radically with sin. You and I must deal radically with sin. You must get rid of anything that causes you to sin. Whatever the cost, whether it is the movies you're watching, the friends you hang out with, Someone at work, a boy or a girlfriend, if it causes you to sin, Jesus said, Ditham, get rid of it. You must be utterly ruthless when it comes to rooting out sin. And why does Jesus tell you to deal so drastically with sin? For one, very simple reason, because sin leads to hell. We read the same thing in Colossians 3, 5 to 6. Shall we read together? Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of this, the wrath of God is coming. 
Church, we are the chosen people of God. We belong to God. Once we have not received mercy, but today we all receive mercy. Not only a chosen people of God, you are a holy nation. If you truly believe in Him, if you truly accept Christ in your life to be your Savior and Lord, we belong to God, we belong to the holy nation of God, and we are His royal priesthood. And so, yes, we will fall, we will sin, but we don't continue to sin. We come together, we pray for one another. We pray for one another because we know that we are weak. Because we know our heart is deceiving. Only God knows us inside out. We need His light to shine. We need God to search us. And so earlier, the pastoral prayer led by Reverend Jasper pray. And may God show us, convict us. Remember, God's grace and forgiveness is here for us. We can approach His throne of all grace anytime anywhere. But it's today. Seize the opportunity. Now back to verse 29 to 30. What Jesus said in these verses is completely true. It would be better to lose your eye or your hand in this life than to lose your whole body in hell. The real problem it's not your eye or your hand, but your heart. You need to guard against anything that would turn your heart from Jesus. And so just like the American mountaineer, Aaron Ralston, he amputated his forearm to break free and make his way down the cliff to safety. We must take extreme measures to get rid of anything in our lives that causes us to sin. So what is the real meaning of adultery? It begins in the mind and in the heart. The sin of adultery is committed by lust in the heart long before any physical act takes place. Next, 31, 32, the meaning of divorce. Now, these two verses, is too simple or too short that we can uh, understand the whole meaning of Divorce. And I will want you to refer to Matthew 19, verse 3 to 9 as well. And so Jesus moved on from the real meaning of adultery to real meaning of divorce. Now these two are connected because adultery can lead to divorce. And as Jesus will show, divorce can lead to adultery. He said, it has been said, anyone who divorces his wife must give her a certificate of divorce. But I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality, makes her a victim of adultery. And anyone who marries a divorced woman commits adultery. God never approved of divorce in the Old Testament. Although he recognized that divorce took place, and so he gave instructions to Moses to regulate it, particularly to protect the woman. 
And one of those protections was the certificate of divorce. The certificate of divorce is mentioned seven times in the Bible. And it had to do three things. Firstly, it states the reason for the divorce. And secondly, it made financial provisions for the woman. And third, it grant her freedom to remarry. Once a man divorced his wife, if she married another man, another person, the first husband could never marry her again. According to Jewish law, only the husband could divorce the wife, although in Romans law, the wife could also divorce the husband. Now, so what does Jesus say about all this? Let me share with you four principles Jesus taught in explaining the real meaning of divorce. First, what God joins together, let men not separate. What God joins together, let men not separate. At every holy matrimony, we witness newly wed, come before the Lord. And one of the content, one of the passage will be this. The pastor will read this. What God joins together, let men not separate. It is God who joins the husband and wife together in marriage. I'm looking at you couples Remember, it is God who joins the husband and wife together in marriage. And so only God can truly dissolve the marriage. Husband and wife, look at each other, remind each other. Yeah, you see, Roger is doing it, so it's good. <laughs> what God has joined together let men not separate. How about Don? How about Dick? And how about uh, Alvin? Marriage mirror God's covenant with us. The union between a man and a woman is uniquely God's creation with a view to portraying the relationship between himself and his people. It shows his faithfulness. His faithfulness. So let us remind, couples, remind ourselves. We come before the Lord. We vow. We took our vow. We must remember what God says in his words. And second, a certificate does not necessarily mean you are divorced. The Pharisees and teachers of the law taught that the certificate of divorce ended the marriage. Jesus says, not necessarily so. He raises the frightening prospect that you are divorced in paper, on paper only, but not in God's sight. Remember, God is the one who joins together in marriage, and therefore only God can separate. And this comes to the third point. So divorce is permitted, but not commanded. Divorce is permitted after adultery, but not commanded. Matthew 19, verse 3 to 9. The Jewish teachers of Jesus' time, they were engaged in various debates over what constituted legal grounds for divorce. 
and some said only in case of adultery, while others thought a man could divorce his wife for almost any reason. Look at verse 7. Why then, they ask, did Moses command that a man give his wife a certificate of divorce and send her away? But before that, they were asking if man can divorce for whatever reason. But look here. He says in verse 3, Pharisees came to him and tested him. They asked, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? The religious leaders, they have been debating what constitute legal grounds. And some listed some of the reasons here from the Talmud. It says, a man can divorce a woman because... She spoiled his dinner or simply because he finds another woman more attractive and the woman's consent to the divorce is not required. So wife, cook good dinner. No, no, not here. They come before Jesus, they ask Jesus, they want to trap them. They want to trap him by asking, did Moses command? But Jesus' reply is, no. Permit your divorce because of the hardness of heart. He used permit, all right? So, when they ask him, is it for any reason? Jesus didn't take any side. The only exception Jesus raised here is for marital unfaithfulness or sexual immorality. Otherwise, even a certificate of divorce, you are still married in God's eye. Jesus, note here, Jesus answered them, not by referencing to Moses' law. That means he didn't refer to Deuteronomy, but he referred to the very origin, and that is the creation account. In other words, Jesus intends to root the meaning of marriage to its original design. Not in a way marriage is managed by the law in view of sin. I repeat, Jesus intends to root the meaning of marriage in his original design. Not in a way marriage is managed by the law in view of sin. He responded. And so now in the kingdom that he was bringing on earth, this original intention is to be rediscovered and reasserted. And so for believers in Christ, let me remind you, your holy matrimony before God, be serious. What God has joined together, let men not separate. Jesus is raising the standard of his disciples, of his followers, above what Moses allowed. Jesus is raising the standard of his disciples. Remember the Sermon of the Mount? That's the characteristic that describes the Christian life in the kingdom of God. So Jesus is raising the standard of his disciples disciples above what Moses allowed. And so he brings us back to the original creation account, how God instituted the marriage between a man and a woman, a man and a woman. Jesus followers in the light of the new life he came to give. Yes, 
we can leave it to his standard, by his saving grace. He interpreted them for his people in the light of the new life he came to give to his disciples. Jesus made a fundamental change here without altering, without changing God's standard. He dealt with the attitudes and intents of the heart and not simply the external actions of adultery. He dealt with the attitudes and intents of the heart. And so what happens if you marry or rather what happens brothers and sisters if you remarry if you are remarried then no matter how it came about this is your new marriage and God calls you to be faithful to your current spouse if you are remarried then no matter how it came about, this is your new marriage and God calls you to be faithful to your current spouse. And lastly, we should always work towards reconciliation. Remember, divorce is a case of adultery. In a case of adultery, it's permitted, but it is not commanded. The emphasis in the scriptures is always on repentance, forgiveness, reconciliations, and restoration. Following Christ means doing everything you can to preserve your marriage. May the Lord help us. May the Lord help us. May the Lord help you. Let me just share a little bit more about the Jewish view of Divorce. When a couple gets married in a Jewish wedding ceremony, their souls become one. It is like a spiritual operation that takes separate beings and fuses them into a new whole. The Jewish divorce ceremony is the reverse of this. It is a spiritual amputation severing one part of the united soul from the other, creating two separate beings. This is what was described. And so divorce, like an amputation, is a tragedy. But sometimes this is the right thing to do. Our attitude, or their attitude, rather, to divorce parallels their attitude to the amputation of a limb in several ways. And so when I got to know about this article, I get to see the passage. Earlier, the first part was talking about the determinations to ampute your arms or gorge your eyes. Amputation. And then, after which, Jesus talked about Divorce, And here, I find it a connection, a very good illustration here. Divorce, like an amputation, is a tragedy, but sometimes it's the right thing to do. Our attitude to divorce parallels, our attitude to the amputations of a limb in several ways. It is painful when a limb becomes so diseased that it endangers the rest of the body. The patient is faced with a horrible choice to face the pain of amputation or risk worse suffering by leaving things as they are. If the future risks are high enough to clearly outweigh the present pain, the right thing to do is cut off the limb. Similarly, divorce is painful for all involved, but it is the right choice when remaining in an unhealthy relationship will only cause more damage, suffering, and heartaches. But 
Divorce is a last resort. He went on, we do everything possible to avoid needing to amputate. If there is a remote chance that the limb can be salvaged, even with great effort and expense, it is worth a try. Only after exhausting all other possibilities would we resort to amputation. Same with divorce, it is only considered after counselling and sincere efforts to change prove fruitless. Third, divorce is not just a plan B. Amputation is not taken lightly. It is not seen as an option if things don't work out. No one would recklessly experiment on their body, saying, if anything happens to my limbs, I can always amputate. Similarly, we don't enter marriage saying, if things don't work out, we can always get a divorce. Divorce should not be a factor in the decisions to get married. Marriage is forever. There is no plan B. Amputees can live a happy and fulfilled life. They may be far better off after their operations than before. But if they could live life over again, they wouldn't choose to go down that path a second time. And so, divorce may sometimes lead to happiness, and true love and contentment may come after the dissolution of a relationship. But if we can reach that point without the pain of divorce, surely that would be preferable. And often when a couple splits up, the question is not why did they get divorced, but rather why did they ever get married in the first place? In many cases, people are divorced for the right reason and married for the wrong reason. This is what he says. High divorce rate should not scare us away from getting married, but rather strengthen our resolve to take marriage seriously and ensure that we are choosing our partners for the right reasons. What are the right reasons? What are the right reasons? Attend the next round premarital course. <laughs> I would like to close this afternoon's message with three application points. A point one, guard your heart. Proverbs 4, 23 says, above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. Each of us is tempted when we are dragged away by our own evil des desire and entice. And so we need to guard our hearts. Remember, some of you may think that, oh, today's topic don't really relate to me. Remember this, sin starts in the heart and works it outwardly. No one ever committed sexual sins who did not decide to do it in their heart first. And how do we, how do you guard your heart? Psalms 119, 9 to 11. Let's read together. How can a young person stay on the path of purity? By living according to your word. I seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart that I may not sin against you. Knowing and reading God's words is essential to guarding our heart. May God help us. And the sec number two is to watch your eyes. Now, Job, said in 31 verse 1, 
Young men, I invite the young men, come, read this. Together, young men? Men? <laughs> right, men. Together, I make a covenant with my eyes not to look lustfully at a young woman. Men, have you made that covenant today? Some of you are looking down. <laughs> Woman, have you made a similar covenant in your own life? Earlier I mentioned about our handphone today. It's so easy. And you'll be hooked, you'll be enticed. Today's fashion, may I just may I describe it? Today's fashion is lesser and lesser, tighter and tighter, shorter and shorter. You know what I mean? It's not because of environment want to save the environment. <laughs> Why is it so? Now there's a difference between dressing attractively and dressing seductively. Men and women know the difference. One of the ways you guard your heart is to watch your eyes. I make a covenant with my eyes not to look lustfully at a young woman. For those seniors, you may think that, oh, this is, oh, I'm not affected. But sometimes I hear you say, I'm young at heart. <laughs> All right, I, I caution. Now the third point, the final point. Honor your marriage. God says in Malachi 2, I hate divorce. He said, guard yourself in your spirit and do not break faith with the wife of your youth. I hate divorce, says the Lord God Almighty. So guard yourself in your spirit and do not break faith. It is a rare thing in the Bible when God is quoted as saying he hates something. If God hates something, you better believe he really hates it. Honour your marriage for couples. Honour your marriage vows. Love and forgive one another. Work towards reconciliation. For God hates divorce. Now, we have all committed adultery in our hearts. And we all need God's grace and forgiveness. We want to thank God. He offers us that forgiveness through Jesus Christ, His Son, and His righteousness. So here I am. I'm, I stand here and preach this passage. I also will be tempted. So let us guard our heart. Watch our eyes and honour our marriage. And so, last, a few reflections, questions for all of you. As followers of Christ, we are called to be pure and holy, not just in our actions, but in our thoughts as well. What are the things that cause you to stumble? And if you are not married, but desire to be? Are you growing in Christ so that you are ready for marriage when you meet your future spouse? How? How? Attend premarital course. If you are married, would you say you and your spouse love each other more today than when you were first married or sitting far, far away. Any couple here sitting far, far away? Spend some moment, 
quiet before the Lord. Amen.